My childhood was as close to perfect as you can possibly get. But when I was 12, my life changed forever. I, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was completely drenched in sweat and absolutely terrified. I had no idea what was going on. My heart was racing. I couldn't breathe and the walls felt like they were closing in around me. That was the night I experienced my first panic attack. As I got older, I started dealing with crippling bouts of depression and severe anxiety. I turned to drugs and alcohol to try and cope with everything. I completely hated myself. I, I felt like I was flawed, I was worthless, and I was broken beyond repair. See, in my mind, I thought I had failed God. By this point in my life, I was really, really good at hiding both my symptoms and my addictions. I, I really hoped that marriage would solve all of my problems, but uh, things continued to spiral out of control and I wasn't able to hide it anymore. It's hard to describe what it feels like when the most important person in your world says that because of you, they're, they're gonna have to walk away. It was by far the worst moment of my life and if I was being completely honest, I would have preferred death than the words that came out of my wife's mouth. I finally accepted that I needed help. In my mind, that meant that I was admitting that something was probably really wrong with me. Words like therapy and treatment and psychosis started coming out, and it's a really scary thing to go through. Pretty quickly, my psychiatrist was able to diagnose me with bipolar II disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. It's not something that you take a pill and you're better. It's something that you will struggle with for the rest of your life. And that was hard to hear. I still struggle with my disease every day. I still fight it every single day. So how, how can I claim to have peace in the midst of something like a panic attack? And how can I claim to have peace when I'm fighting depression? It's because I'm not fighting the battle alone. Jesus has given me peace in the midst of my own chaos. And I have peace because I've seen firsthand what God can do with the most broken of people because I am that broken person. And I'm standing here as living proof that there is no one so broken and no one so flawed and no one so sick that Jesus cannot and will not heal them and use them to further his kingdom. He is where my peace comes from. He is my peace. Good morning. So I asked you last week, how many of you were slaves? And you, you got what I was talking about. Let me ask you another question today. Be honest. How many of us are broken? Right? I, I think one way or another we can all admit we're broken. Here's what I want you to know today. God wants to use your brokenness. God did not create your brokenness. But God will use your brokenness. As he did throughout the Bible, each and every person, as we've been going through Genesis, we read from the first page all the way up to where we're at today, and today we're going to talk about brokenness. But the one thing I want you to realize is if you look through the pages of this glorious book, there are people like you and I who have struggled like you and I, who've made mistakes like you and I, who've had disappointments like you and I. They were broken like you and I, and God used them mightily. 
we read about them today because they allowed God to use their brokenness to not only heal themselves, but to heal others. You do realize God allows you to go through things for his purpose, right? God doesn't create it, but God can look down on and say, hmm, he believes in you. He knows you can get through this. And he knows you'll be better on the other side of this. Because you can also be a comforter, a counselor, camaraderie, to help other people get through hard times in life. Amen? And the main focus today is, is death. Today, Sarah dies. I don't know if you know that, but Sarah dies today if you've been reading your Bible. That death is, a, is an interesting thing when we look at brokenness. The one thing in that video that gentleman talks about his brokenness and his context. Susan and I were down here praying a minute ago, and Susan started praying for broken people. Nobody knew what I was preaching on today, but God did. God always knows what we're going through. Are you aware of that? He always knows. But I think one of the hardest breakings is when someone dies. There's this story of these three friends, and they were sitting around at a uh, food gathering after a funeral, and they, they'd been friends for a long time, and they said, wonder what the pastor will say when we die. First guy said, I, I really want him to say, I was, a, I was a great humanitarian and did wonderful things for everybody in the community. The second person says, I, I want him to say I was a good husband. I was a good man and, and a good father and, and, and did my best to live out my Christian life. The third guy answered quickly, I want him to say, look, he's moving. Early morning, I know. You know, the truth of it is, as long as we've been doing this thing called life from Genesis, I can tell you now, research has proven that 99.99% of all people are going to die. I don't know if you're aware of that. Statistically, it's going to happen. There's only The reason why it's not 100% is there are two people in the Bible who passed to heaven without dying. And so unless the Lord comes back and takes us all to heaven, you're going to die. I'm going to die. And while that seems kind of simple, while that seems weird, it is also truth. I say in funerals all the time, at the, the Greeks believe at the end of a good life should be a good death. But what exactly does a good death look like? What will your final period in the sentence of your life look like? Will it be full of bitterness? Will it be praising God? Will there be clarity or not? Will it be painful or easy? You know, uh, Susan and a lot of people are like, I just want to go in my sleep, nice and comfortable, right? No. I want to come in hot. You've heard me say it. I'm coming in. At my funeral, you guys are going to be like, that guy was an idiot. I can't believe he died like that, right? I don't want the, oh, he died in his sleep, comfortable. And I and understand I want to say this very, I do not want to die in the bathroom, right? I don't want that story either. I, I want some crazy story of climbing Mount Everest and finding a, a goat that knocks me off and I die or something, something like that, right? He served the Lord and then the locals ate him. I don't know. But I promise you, I want a great story, right? But it's interesting, studying amongst the, the saints of our church, you guys who have lost someone, and hearing the stories, hearing your brokenness. As I intermingle with many of you guys and people watching online that I interact with, and the brokenness in your relationships and your marriages, maybe at work, maybe here, maybe there, sure seems to be a lot of brokenness today in the world, isn't there? Join me as we read in Genesis 23. We're only in the 23rd chapter. Tomorrow we start Argus, and we're only in the 23rd chapter. Somebody's probably thinking, regretting, telling me they wanted me to start in Genesis and work through the Bible in a year. It's impossible to do it in a year. It just is. I only get one day a week. 
right? We'll be done with Genesis sometime next year, I promise you. Here's how the NIV reads. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. Terry Garris, you beat her. <laughs> he's, I think he's wearing this here in H today. She died at Karath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Could you just imagine weeping over your loved one like that? Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I'm a foreigner and stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites, and he said to him, if you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf. So he will sell me the cave at Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people. And he replied to Abraham in a hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of his city. No, my Lord, he replied, listen to me. I give you the field. I give you the cave that's in it. I give you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people pop, before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in their hearing, listen to me if you will. Pray, I will pay the price of the field. I'm like Ron Burgundy. I just read what's ever on the teleprompter, huh? The price of the field, accept it for me so I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, listen to me, my Lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver, but what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and weighed up to him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight current among the merchants. So Ephron's filled at Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field in Machpelah near Mamre, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And so the field and the cave in it were deeded by the Hittites as a burial site. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. Lord, would you be with us this morning? Help each and every one of us as we learn to navigate this life, as we need learn to navigate brokenness. Father, I know many people are in this room right now, watching online, have a broken story. While we may walk in with a facade and greet each other and love on each other with smiles on our faces, Lord, I can see the, the tears behind their eyes. Lord, I can feel my own tears. Lord, would you help us this morning? Not only are we broken, our families are broken, our, our country and our world are broken, and we fight and we scream, and Lord, help us. Help us to heal. And Lord, use our brokenness. Let us not go through these seasons of life for nothing. Lord, may our brokenness be your gain for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Sooner or later, we will mourn. Sooner or later, we'll grieve. Sooner or later, we're going to be broken. I know for many seniors, there's, there's this brokenness. There's this grieving over the, the loss of a spouse. Maybe the loss of a child, loss of income, loss of mobility, loss of strength, loss of income, loss of agility. Roy hasn't lost too much of it. For young people, the young people are broken too. Life's disappointments, what people have done to them, what they've done to themselves, uh, their jobs, their dreams, their careers, 
what people have said, what we have said, all these different things, they all come into it. It's almost as if we live in a world of brokenness, of disappointment, despair. Am I preaching yet? This is why we come to church. You do realize that, right? This is the place of hope. I I remember one time, uh, uh, somebody put out tissues all over the sanctuary. And I told them, like, listen, this isn't a crying sermon. What is going on? I I don't really do those sermons. I mean, if you cry, it's going to be from the Holy Spirit, not from me guilting you or beating you down or telling you you're going to hell. That's not the sermon. But for some reason, there were tissues everywhere. But it was interesting throughout the sermon, and it was very positive. I kept seeing tissues being picked up. Because we carry our brokenness here with us, don't we? This is why we come to the altars before the sermon. I want you to realize many of us are carrying backpacks. I've been teaching this ever since I was a youth pastor. Imagine you have this backpack on your back and you keep putting the pains and the hurts of this world in it where it belongs. And we carry our brokenness with us everywhere we go. And it gets heavy, doesn't it? It gets weighed down, doesn't it? Listen, that's what Jesus died for. Jesus died for your backpack. He he died for all those pains you were carrying away. And and problems, and the idea of coming to the altar is take it off and put it down. And when you get up, leave it there. Too many of us walk up and we, you know, imaginally lay it down and then we get up, we grab it, and we carry it away with us, right? And then we use our brokenness, we use our pain to hurt other people, to justify it because we're broken And we're just going to break everybody around us. And remember what I said, hurt people, hurt people. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. I believe we all go through seasons. And I said that plural, of brokenness. Seasons of pain. Seasons of disappointment. But there's good news in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. He says he's overcame the world. So this morning, I just want to talk about four things. I believe brokenness can do to us, right? Or for us. See, Sarah lived, and and I want to use this, Sarah lived 127 years. Mathematically, we can look at this and realize her and Abraham, uh, at, at a Marian age during that time, had to be together for over 110 years. to be together 110 years and to lose the love of your life. How painful that had to be. Stan, what was it you were telling me? You and Nancy's anniversary, you would have been how many years? 67. 67. That's a lifetime, isn't it? And I can go around and I see each and every one of you widows and widowers. I've heard your pain. I've heard about your loneliness. For you who have lost a child, I've heard that too. And your brokenness over it. God never intended that. I want you to know that God did not create death. That's what sin did. God never created us to, hurt, to die. That's why it hurts so bad. The same hurt while it may not be as severe, it's just as emotionally painful as divorces and, and wayward children when our kids get mad and leave us and, and yell and scream and throw fits, that hurts us. I mean, pain, none of us are immune to it. It will come. But I want to let you know, it will only be a season. It's not a life sentence. Remember, Jesus says, I've overcame the world. The best advice I can give you is if you're broken, you're in pain, and you want to lash out, be still and know that God is with you. Amen? So here's what I want to say. God will use our brokenness. We all at some point in time have been broken, and there's trials and tribulations and everything else, but God will use our brokenness if we allow him. And the first way God will use our brokenness is our brokenness can build character. In Psalms 34, 18, here's what it says. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. 
You ever notice that when we're broken, that God uses us? We listen to him. We're more attentive to him when we're broken. When we're broken, we also start to inspect who we are. We start to see the guys. Think about it. Peter denies Jesus three times. First, he's got a knife out, being the man, going to save Jesus. But then whenever it comes to his own hide, he denies. And we read in Luke chapter 22 where Peter, when he realizes how messed up he is, how broken he is over what he's done, it says he wept bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly over something you've done that broke you and other people? I think we can all say yes, right? Not only do we hurt ourselves, we hurt people around us. I, I, it's kind of like sin. Sin is never just about us. Sin affects everyone around us, right? Same with brokenness. Usually when we break, we, we love our friends enough, we'll break them too, right? Especially with our kids, our kids will break us, won't they? They will break us because they trust us that we're gonna love them through this. And if you're a parent, love your kids no matter what. No matter what they're doing, love them. You're the walking image of God in their lives of unconditional love. See, that brokenness that Peter felt was a conviction and God will use our convictions of wrong to change us, to get us back on track because God loves us enough. He will not leave us the way we are. Amen? I think that's that's the good news of holiness. We need to be telling people uh, about our faith in God. God loves you enough. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you enough. He won't leave you where he found you. God wants to sanctify you. God wants to cleanse you and free you from that bondage of slavery we talked about last week. But God can only find you in that place when you and I finally submit and realize we're broken and we need a savior, right? I mean, that's the idea behind a savior, somebody to save us. But it's only when we realize we can't save ourselves. When we think about Moses in uh, Genesis, we'll get to sometime, probably next year, uh, you find out that Moses was a very broken person, right? And God sent him to the desert to break him. He always says, I I don't talk too well. Listen, if Moses had a speech impediment, he lived in Pharaoh's house, he would have had the best speech pathologist out there, right? He would have had everything he ever needed to be successful, and I believe Moses was. But when God took Moses to the desert, Moses no longer had any resources, no longer had any assistance, stripped away everything. Serves just Moses and God. Moses was broken in the desert. He became humble. And God used him in a mighty way. Because God wants to build your character. Character is built amongst brokenness. When you and I make mistakes, you ever think about this? We change drastically at our worst, don't we? When we are absolutely broken when we absolutely are taken to those emotional deserts like Moses, we begin to get our heads on. We begin to see clearly. We begin to get focused. And we can rise up. Amen? Your brokenness can build character if you let it. Because brokenness, you realize what you did. Now if you can focus on what you need to do. But it takes strength. You do realize that, right? Building character takes real strength to say, I no longer want to live this way. I no longer am going to act this way. I am no longer going to speak this way. I'm no longer going to do this, and I'm no longer going to do that. I'm going to be strong enough, and I'm not going to do that no more. God can use your brokenness to build your character when you and I get to the point in time where we're sick of ourselves. You ever get sick of yourself? I do about every other hour, right? I mean, if you knew the discussions I had in my head, you would think I was crazy. I, I've told a few people in here, I, almost every time I've left a meeting, I, I've walked away going, Brad, you just should have shut up. 
Brad, you talk too much. Brad, you da da da. And I use those to teach myself. Slow down. Listen more. Talk less. Amen? Except for on Sunday mornings. You like me talking, don't you? The other thing brokenness can do is bring us closer to God. It says this in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me. Stop. This is Jesus talking. Jesus knows your brokenness. Remember that Savior, to save us, we need Jesus. And so Jesus invites us to him when we're broken. He says, come to me. Don't go to your best friend who's giving you bad advice. Don't go to your mama and your daddy. Right? Don't go to that homeless guy on the corner. Don't run to the bar. Don't run here. Don't go there. The instructions are this. Come to me. All you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. No one will give you rest like Jesus. I'm not talking about a physical rest. I'm talking about that spiritual, emotional rest that we need. He says, take my yoke. Not yours, because yours is heavy, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. That's a promise from Jesus. Come to me. See, our, our brokenness, we can draw closer to God because God will be all that's needed for step one. Don't miss that first step. Any, any process of anything, whether it's 12 steps of recovery for alcoholism or drugs or codependency or whatever, step one, go to God. Then you do the other steps right? First thing is seek God. If you really believe God is God, then you've got to go to God first. Usually when people come to me with problems, first thing I'm going to say, have you prayed yet? How much time have you spent with God with this first? Because I'm not God. I can't heal your pains. I can't heal your problems. I can give you counsel, but I'm not God. So I will always tell you, seek God first. Amen? And so the other thing I, I think that brokenness can do, it can push us to our purpose, right? As I talked about a, a minute ago, in this book, and, and I love these big Bibles, right? These big Bibles are kind of cool, but you ever notice nobody carries them, right? But this one here, from the front page to the back page, there was only one perfect person. Remember, go to him. 98% of this book is written by imperfect people like you and I. Who in the midst of their mess-ups and screw-ups and downright sinful natures and, and evilness sought God, got right, and got promoted. And we read about that today. I want you to know God will use you if you let him. Think about how many times Abraham has messed up. And he keeps getting up. And God keeps using him. How many times Noah screwed up, this person screwed up, that person screwed up. And God uses him. God will use you. He will allow your brokenness to push you to your purpose. How many times have you gone through something and afterwards be like, you know what? I think I want to help people with this. How many times have we been to a, a bad church? I, this is my experience. I've been to bad churches and seen bad things. So God has pushed me to my purpose to make sure that I be the pastor he calls me to be. And honestly, I'm imperfect about that. But every day I keep trying. I mess up like you and I. But God wants to use you. He'll use your brokenness for a purpose. Maybe he's calling you to do something. Maybe he's calling you to change something. Maybe he's calling you to live something. But I promise you, God will not waste the season of brokenness in your life. He will use it for his glory. But you gotta, one, draw close to him. Listen to him, submit to him, 
and allow him to use you. Amen? I think the last one is this. In our brokenness, God will give us a testimony. It says this in Psalm 66, 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare to you what he has done for my soul. Now, a few minutes ago, we talked about our soul. Here we are talking about our soul. You realize your brokenness, heavy brokenness, hits you way inside. But this one's coming here. Your testimony changes the world. You realize that, right? There are people who don't believe in miracles because apparently we've not been telling them our testimony of what we've done. Your testimony is the most powerful thing you have because you've lived it. You're a walking witness. Testimonies are also what this book is made up of, what people have gone through. You realize that's what this is, right? This is people's testimonies throughout the Bible. It's Jesus, testimony of what Jesus did and how Jesus healed. And your testimony does the same thing minus the resurrection. Your testimony can give people hope, but you've got to come out of the brokenness. Abraham did not go home after bearing Sarah, sat in his chair and lick his wounds for another 38 years. Abraham lived another 38 years after Sarah's death. I've seen where a death of a child, a death of a spouse can incapacitate somebody. Listen, Abraham had to get up. If the first century was going to make it past its period of faith, Abraham had to get busy living, not dying. Tell your testimony of what God has done for you in the middle of your brokenness. Stop looking at what the hurt is. Now, how many times have you heard me say, you only have a victory after the battle? If you stay in the battle, you'll never have a victory. If all we do is sit around and talk about how bad our brokenness is, how bad the pain is, and we stay there, and I become, you ever see anybody, or maybe it's you, your brokenness becomes your identity? And all you have to do is barely scratch the skin of the surface for it to come out. That's not how God calls you to live. You cannot have a testimony until you're past that. The prodigal son only became the prodigal son after he got right and came home. Your testimony will have power when you rise above the pain, when you rise above the brokenness. And that's exactly what Abraham does. He gets up. His sons needed him. The community needed him. God needed him. And today we need them. We need to see that death or brokenness doesn't have to be a life sentence. It can literally be used for God's glory if we allow it. Don't let what Satan has done in our world muddy up what God wants to do with you. Amen? We need to learn to categorize what God does and what God doesn't. Whenever someone dies of cancer, we've got to quit blaming God. God did not put junk in our food. We did that to ourselves, amen? Out of greed, we started putting injections and food and chemicals. We did it to ourselves, but yet we want to blame God. When we have addictions, let's stop blaming God. See, this is one thing Peter had to do when he wept bitterly. He began to actually take ownership, Right? You and I need to begin to take ownership. If someone died, that, you don't need to take ownership. The only ownership you need to take is of yourself to get back up. Mourn. We're all allowed time to mourn. And it could take years, as many of our saints have told me. But that doesn't mean we stay in the posture of mourning forever. You have those moments, but you got to rise up. This morning, Abraham will get up and get busy. I want to challenge you the same way. If you're broken, submit to God. Repent from whatever is 
hurting. Maybe it's you. If it's not you, don't worry about it. Just give it to God. And Jesus says, go to him. Give it to him. Take your backpack off and leave it. And then let God build your character from there. That's how we do not make mistakes again when we build that character. Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone sins. But when you allow God to work in those moments, your character builds, right? IBM in the 80s would not hire someone until, unless there was somewhere on their resume, they had failed. Did you know that? IBM was the apple of the day. I mean, they were huge, right? But they would not hire you unless somewhere on your resume you've been fired or some travesty in your career. You know why? Because they knew once you had made a mistake and felt that pain, that brokenness, you would work hard to never replicate that again. God is the same way. God forgives us. And he gives us another chance and another chance and another chance. I don't know what your brokenness is today. Maybe you have lost a spouse. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost your income. Maybe you've lost your ability to drive. Maybe you've lost a relationship. Maybe you've lost this. Maybe you've lost that. I don't know what you lost. And I don't know what broke you. But if you're broken today, I know a healer. His name is Jesus. Allow him to touch you inside your soul. The scripture today kept pointing out our souls. The worst brokenness is when our soul is broken. That's where God wants to meet you. That's where Jesus died. It's the only thing going to heaven. You know that, right? This old body, whether you got no hair or a head full of hair, ain't going. God wants to heal your soul. If you're broken this morning, Maybe you're upset over the world and its problems. Guess what? So am I and so is God. Why don't we let God work that out? And in the meantime, why don't you and I just focus on loving each other, helping each other out. As you look around the room, you may seem like you got it all right. You may have it okay. I promise you the person next to you may not be. That's why we need to be here every week. Maybe not for ourselves. Maybe you need to be here for someone else. Yes, we need God, but we need each other. That's why Paul says, do not forsake the assembly. Maybe you may have be on time in your life. Come and share your joy. Other people need to feel it. Come and share your love. Others need to embrace that. But I can promise you there'll be a day where you're going to need a withdrawal from the investment you've made and bring in your emotional support to others, your wise counsel. The stuff you've been through, God will use for his glory that you can come and counsel one another and help each other heal. Remember, page one, page two. It's not good for us to be alone. Satan loves to get you alone in your brokenness, doesn't he? You can be in a room full of people, surrounded by thousands of people, and feel completely alone. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. He's going to make sure you're too tired to go to church. He's going to make sure you feel a little achy. He's going to make sure I offended you last week. Right? Oh, if I've not offended you, just hang out long enough, I will. I'm an equal opportunity offender, apparently. Satan will do everything he can to get you. Just make sure you give you to God. Because if you give you to God, Satan can't get you. But he'll try to get the people around you peripheral. Brokenness. We all face it. But we can all survive it. Amen? Let me pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. Lord, would you go before us today and every day of our lives and heal us. Father, as I stated earlier, I know within this room, there has to be broken people. For those watching online, I know there has to be broken people. Father, while we don't need to go around confessing to everyone how messed up we are, Lord, can we just begin to love each other? 
help each other out of brokenness, to be wise counsel for one another. Lord, help us when we've lost a loved one. Help us when we're losing our kids. Help us when we lose our health, our strength, our income. Lord, help us in our unbelief that you too could resurrect us from our current situations. And to give us the testimonies that we hear so many people talk about what you did in their lives. And Lord, would you do that with us? Would you give us that testimony so we too can give you all the glory and all the praise because you are our Savior and we need you to save us now. Walk with us, Lord. Speak with us. Forgive us and heal us. In Jesus' great and holy name, amen.